Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're just going to wait a few seconds so everyone can enter from the waiting room. Okay. Hi, I'm Judy. I'm the Executive Director of FEAST, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. We're going to start with a few housekeeping rules. Um, please keep your microphone and your video off during the entire duration of the webinar. Um, and if you have questions, you can just put them in the chat box and Aaron is gonna answer them at the end. Um, and I just request, because I'm the one who reads the questions to Aaron, um, if you can please write your questions as clearly as possible, I would really, really appreciate it. And now I'm gonna introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Aaron Parks is a clinical psychologist, researcher, and co-founder of EQUIP, a virtual eating disorder program that delivers evidence-based treatment for lasting recovery. Aaron has over 15 years of experience with adolescents and adults in inpatient, partial hospitalization, and intensive outpatient settings, where she has experienced firsthand the disparity in who gets diagnosed and who has access to quality treatment. Erin is passionate about quality mental health treatment and helping families differentiate between treatment that feels good and treatment that actually works. Erin, thank you so much for being with us today. I'll let you get started now. Thank you so much for inviting me, Judy, and to all of these. I'm really excited to be here. And and I love talking about this topic. Um, so today we wanna to talk about what do you do when you're walking on eggshells? Um, and I think that's a very common thing that happens in eating disorders. Now, just in case I'm being too much of an American Midwesterner saying eggshells, I wanna make sure everyone knows what we mean. Um, so this is when you feel like you just don't know what to say. Maybe it feels like landmines, like you don't know where to step, that if I say this, maybe they'll be fine, but some days I say this and they start crying. Um, maybe some people think of it as like stepping on Legos. I'm someone who has young kids and that's what I step on all the time right now. But it's this feeling of almost, you almost being like a prisoner in your own house, um, not knowing your child anymore, wanting to help them, but having no idea what to say. With the hundreds and hundreds of families that I've met through both my, my fellowship and training at UC San Diego, um, and now my work at Equip, um, a common theme that I hear is the unexpectedness, that they don't know what to say because sometimes they say it and it lands fine, and sometimes they say it and it results in a big emotion. So some of the most common emotions that I've heard parents talk about experiencing is that when they say something, their child gets really sad, their child cries, their child runs to their room, or their child yells at them. The child gets angry. The child says hurtful things like you don't understand, you don't get it. Um, and other people see their child get really defiant. That's when a plate gets thrown. That's when they leave the house. So there's lots of different reasons why people might be walking on eggshells. Um, and then there's also a lot of different topics that cause it. So I've had some parents say, I feel like I can't say the word eating disorder. Or if they're in treatment, maybe they're in treatment for a couple hours a day, I can't ask them like, oh, how was treatment today? Or what happened without them getting mad at me? Or I know that I'm supposed to be helping them eat more often or eat larger meals or a wider variety of meals. But every time I say something like, I think you need another scoop or um, did you eat snack when you were at school today? They yell at me, stop asking me what I'm eating all the time. And so the parents feel like they can do nothing right and I can't see you all right now, but I hope you're kind of nodding your heads and that you've experienced, well, I hope, I don't hope that you've experienced it, but I hope that you know that you're not alone. It's a really common experience as a parent of feeling like I have no idea what to do. I have no idea what to say, and I'm walking on eggshells. I want to make sure that I don't bury the lead here. There are no magic words for you to say. And I really, my wish for all parents is that they take this pressure off themselves, that if they just said the most perfect words, then their child would tell them all about how their therapy session went. Or if they just said the most perfect words, then their child would say, like, okay, mom, I'll have another scoop of that. Or if they said the most perfect words, and they'd say, yeah, dad, I am feeling sad and had a hard day. Thanks for asking about my feelings. Take away this sense that there are perfect words. They don't exist. There are not other parents who are doing this better than you that have figured it out. This is not a deficit with you because you haven't found the perfect words. So 
with that all out there and try really hard to remind yourself, remind your spouse, remind the other adults and healthy people in the home of that, remind the siblings too. You didn't do anything wrong. There's no perfect thing to say to someone when they're going through an eating disorder. Okay, but with all that in mind, I think this is the other really hard pill to swallow. Not only are there no perfect words to say, but if you want the eggshells to no longer be on the floor of your home, you're the one who has to sweep up the eggshells. Your child is not going to be the one that makes the eggshells go away. Your child's therapist is not going to say some magic words to your child so that your child now can handle when you ask them, you know, did you eat your snack at lunch? So while we know here at Feast, deep down in our souls, that parents do not cause eating disorders, this is not the opposite of that, but it's saying that you are in control about whether or not there are eggshells in your house. Um, and so I want to say a little bit more about that. So when we talk about there being eggshells in the house, what we're really saying is that we are afraid of our child's reaction, which often means we're afraid of our child's emotion. So one of the first steps, and this is true, whether you're walking on eggshells with your spouse, who you're really struggling in your marriage with, whether you're work, walking on eggshells with your sister or your mother and you're having a hard relationship with them, whether you're walking on eggshells at work because things seem uncertain. When we say we're walking on eggshells, what we really mean is that we are afraid of a reaction, which usually means we're afraid of an emotion. So the first step as parents is to really just get quiet away from, you know, don't do this immediately after an outburst has happened. And just think about what is the emotion that I'm so afraid of? Try to label that emotion. Is it my kid's sadness? Is it their anger? Is it their fear? And start to figure out what is it that's so scary about it? And then what you'll do next though, is think about what is the emotion that that produces in you? Because usually that is what we're most scared of. Yeah, we're scared of our kids saying, I hate you. Or if you make me eat this, I'm going to kill myself. And we're scared of our kid sobbing and saying, you don't understand. But what really, really hurts is that emotion that comes to us afterwards, that feeling of hopelessness. I'm never going to be able to help them get better. That feeling of shame. I don't know how to take care of my child. That feeling of deep, deep worry of this is never going to get better. And that is really the emotion that most of us are avoiding when we're walking on eggshells. So we don't ask them to take another bite because we don't want them to get mad because we don't wanna feel hopeless. And this is big work to do. Um, this is why we say, if you have access to getting your own therapist, do that. If you, I just cannot say enough about the feast support groups and the feast message boards, find other people who've been through it and start talking with them about the emotions that come up and how you can tolerate that emotion inside yourself of being worried about your child, that emotion inside yourself of being angry. That's also a really normal emotion to come up. You do all of these things for your kids. You say one thing wrong and they scream at you to have the urge to scream back of like, who the F do you think you are, right? That's a normal emotion to also feel that anger. Um, but figure out what that emotion is that you're so scared of. It's normal to be scared of it and get some support or figuring out how you're going to move through it. A big part of not walking on eggshells is getting to the point where we're no longer afraid of our child's emotions and our own emotions. And a big thing that we can do is start reframing it. So let's go back to our child's emotions. And this is something a lot of us experienced when our kids were younger is it's hard for us seeing our kids be sad, whether they're sad because, you know, we told them that they couldn't stick their fingers in the socket when they're two and we keep, you know, pulling them away from it or whether they're sad for, um, because it's time for us to leave grandma and grandpa's house and drive home. It's hard to see them sad. We don't like seeing our kids sad. So one thing that we can do though, is start reframing the emotion. Um, my former boss, Dr. Walt K used to say, the brain doesn't care if we're happy. The brain just wants us to stay alive. We were not meant to only feel happiness. We were meant to feel the whole spectrum of emotion. And so one bit of work for us to do as parents is st start reframing what it means for our child to feel angry, for our child to feel scared, for our child to feel sad. 
and let our children know that we aren't scared of that emotion. We love being with our children when they're happy, but we also love them when they're scared. We love them when we're, they're angry. We love them when they're afraid. And really getting into that emotional space uh, in DBT, we call it willing hands that like, we're here for it. Whatever emotion they want to bring, we're here for it. Um, and, and we can handle it. We don't need to walk on eggshells because we can handle you being angry. We don't need to walk on eggshells because we can handle you being sad. And the next step of work is how are we going to reframe our fear of the emotion? And for this, I want to read something that Una Miller Hansen wrote. Um, Una Miller is prolific on Instagram. If you don't follow her, she's got really great advice for um, parents whose kids have eating disorders, but also parents who are just parents of kids and navigating this diet culture place that we live. She's also a family mentor at Equip um, and helped her child to recover from an eating disorder. So she wrote, for months and months, we were afraid to say the words eating disorder and anorexia. We were walking on eggshells, avoiding those words. My teenager was in treatment at the time. They'd done inpatient, residential, PHP, but was not getting better. One day, their younger sibling, who was 10 at the time, referred to the older child's eating disorder and anorexia as the thing. And it hit me that it was like in Harry Potter where everyone refers to the evil Voldemort as he who must not be named. The characters in Harry Potter, they think that they're protecting themselves by not saying his name, but in reality, they are living in fear and giving the evil being even more power. And it's only Harry Potter who isn't afraid to say the name who has the power to confront and defeat Voldemort. This is around the time when they went to UC San Diego for the IFT week and they went all in with FBT. And they got comfortable using the actual words eating disorder and anorexia without fear or shame. And that helped give us the power to face and conquer this evil force in our lives. So this is a big part of getting over getting over. That sounds like such an easy thing to do. Just get over the eggshells. It's a hard thing to do. This is an incredibly hard ask, but you're living in a prison with eggshells all over the floor of your home right now. And one thing to do is to reframe the fear of the emotion. What is it that we're afraid of? And how can you remind yourself that you are capable of handling your child's emotions? You are capable of handling your own emotions. You can do this and you can do this with some help. Uh, yes, it's Una Hansen and Anji. You got it. So since your kid is not going to sweep up the eggshells for you, since your kid's therapist is not going to sweep up the eggshells for you, it's up to you to figure out how to sweep up these eggshells. And one way is to go get skills. Now, I am overly biased and a huge fan of DBT skills, dialectical behavior therapy skills. Um, one of the great things about these skills is you can Google DBT skills and there are just hundreds of videos on YouTube of teaching these different skills. These skills are designed to help people to handle really big emotions. So one of the four modules of DBT is called distress tolerance. And it's something that I really recommend to all parents as they figure out how to tolerate the distress of their child's emotions, but importantly, tolerate their own emotions. It big, brings up such huge emotions in us when our children are struggling. How can we manage our own feelings of hopelessness, our own feelings of worry and anxiety, our own feelings of shame, of anger and sadness. One of the first things to do is to label the emotion, to figure out what it is your you think your child is feeling, but most importantly, what it is you are feeling, what it is you fear, what comes up for you when you do say eating disorder and they get mad at you. What are you tiptoeing around? But the next thing is distress tolerance. So this is figuring out you're going to feel hopeless. You are going to feel sad. You're going to feel anxious. You're going to feel ashamed. How are you going to tolerate feeling those emotions? Those are very, very hard emotions to feel for anybody, no matter why that emotion is coming up. So how are you going to tolerate feeling that way? Um, one tip is self-soothe. And I know that when your child is going through an eating disorder, it's just not great to hear like, get nice smelling lotion and use it so that you can self-soothe. You're like, great, that's really going to help defeat anorexia. That's really going to help with bulimia. But it's truly a bunch of really, really small things to help build yourself up. So look at your day. 
are you having any moments of silence? Are you having any time where you're not a parent, where you're not a caregiver, where you're not working a job? Do you have some time to yourself? Some of the distress tolerance skills in DBT are around the five, um, five senses. Um, that's a great question. We'll get to that. I like that. Um, are around the five senses. So how can you use, certainly scent comes up often with self-care. So this is the bubble bath and this is the lotion and this is the scented candle. Now, if you light a scented candle and then spend your whole time being like, how the heck is this going to make me feel better? <laughs> and I am so scared. Um, it, it's not going to do much. Part of it is about helping you get to baseline, helping to take your 10 out of 10 anxiety and move it to a nine, your 10 out of 10 worry and move it to an eight. How can you just start lowering your emotions a little bit so that you have the space to help your child with their emotions? Other self school, self, self soothe skills involve some of the other senses. So this can be sound. Um, I know some of this sounds a bit woo woo and that's what I thought too when I first heard some of it. Uh, but one thing is just going outside and just setting your alarm on your phone for five minutes and just hearing what you can hear and label the sounds as you hear them. I admit that I had no idea that there were birds outside my house for many, many years until I finally sat down and had some silence and heard them. And that helps to ground you and bring you to a calmer place. Other people use sensations of taste to self-soothe. Maybe there's a favorite recipe from your childhood. Maybe it's chocolate. Maybe for me, it's spiral macaroni and cheese. And some people use taste. Some people use physical touch. This can be cuddling with someone. This can be getting massages. This could be sitting in a bath of warm water. So figure out how you are going to care for yourself, how you're going to self-soothe and make it a practice of doing it. One of the great benefits of this is you're modeling for your child. Your child is going to go through so many difficult emotions in order to get to the other side of their eating disorder. And let's face it, even though life is full of some great things, life is also full of some really hard things that come with hard emotions. A big part of getting through an eating disorder is learning how to not fight against your emotions, how not to act from a place of your emotions. And that is your kid's going to need to learn self-care and self-soothing skills and a great excellent way to learn it is by having it be modeled on a regular basis in the home. Another thing that is really helpful is building up the positives. Right now, you're fighting an eating disorder. And I know that when your kid is sick, every single cell in your body hurts. It's hard to do this, but figure out what are the positives you can build up in your life. Maybe it's you and another child taking a painting class for an hour a week. Maybe it is you knitting with a friend across the street. Maybe it's you going on walks with your brother regularly for 15 minutes after dinner. I don't know what it is for you, but figure out how you're going to build up the other positives in your life because Ed is not a one-time thing, right? You're going to fight it day after day after day after day, and you have to be prepared for that fight. I know that we use a lot of war and fighting type metaphors when we talk about fighting Ed, but it really is emotionally and physically depleting. And so if you're going to be able to get through it and your child's going to be able to get through it, you're going to have to be taking care of yourself and modeling that. The next DBT skill that can be really helpful to stop walking on eggshells is radical acceptance. This is something kind of Una was addressing and realizing we just got to call the eating disorder an eating disorder. We just have to say anorexia is we need to radically accept that this is reality. It is reality that when I ask my child to take one more bite, they're gonna yell and it is what it is. It is reality that they feel sad and that they feel scared and that there aren't magic words or things I can do to make that fear or that sadness go away. Radical acceptance can do a lot to helping you feel less hopeless, if that makes sense. So I just want to say a few more things about what radical acceptance means and kind of the first way it was explained to me. I learned from Dr. Leslie Anderson at the UC San Diego Eating Disorder Center, and she gives us an example of an apartment. So I'm starting with something significantly less severe than an eating disorder, but sometimes that's what's needed to go back to the basics to really understand and embrace the skill. So radical acceptance. She talks about someone who is so excited to move into their new apartment. And they'd done a final walkthrough with the landlord. 
and the apartment was painted this just grotesque kind of, is it neon green? Is it baby poop green? This awful color. So they love the apartment, but they say to the landlord, I'm just confirming that you're painting this all back to white before they before I move in. The landlord's like, of course, of course, I'm painting it back to white before you move in. So give the deposit, sign all the paperwork, ready to go. It was the final walkthrough and said, okay, it'll be good to go. You'll be able to move in in two weeks. So two weeks go by and you spend those two weeks packing up your apartment and moving is such a hassle, right? So you spend all this time loading things into boxes, loading your boxes into your U-Haul. It's finally the day of the move and you drive to your new apartment. You are so excited. You're finally moving into your own apartment and you walk in and the walls are all neon green. They didn't repaint it. They were supposed to repaint it, but they didn't repaint it. As expected, you feel frustrated. You feel angry. You feel like you've been ripped off. So you call the landlord, go straight to voicemail. Call the landlord again, go straight to voicemail. And you try and try and try to get a hold of the landlord. No luck. Now you have a couple different options. If you don't want to practice radical acceptance, you can do things like sleep in your U-Haul. You could put a blindfold on your eyes the entire time that you're in your apartment. You could call that landlord a hundred times a day, every day for the next eight months, living in this disgusting poop green apartment for eight months while well, you just call the landlord day after day and tell everyone that you meet how unfair it was that the landlord didn't do what they were supposed to do. And then the landlord has just completely ghosted you. You could do all of those things. You would be miserable. You would be suffering. So when you don't radically accept something, that is what brings on the suffering. Or you can radically accept that the landlord was a jerk, they didn't do what they were saying they were going to do, and you are going to move into your awesome new apartment that you've been excited to move into, and you're just going to paint the, the walls white yourself. Maybe you'll choose to handle it by not sending in a month of rent. Maybe you'll choose to handle it by writing a negative review on Yelp. Who knows? But you are going to paint those walls white yourself because you're just going to radically accept that the landlord didn't do what they were supposed to do. That's what happens oftentimes with Ed. We get stuck in the like, it's not fair that this is happening. I should be able to say this. I shouldn't have to walk on eggshells in my own house. Once we radically accept, our kid might behave like a jerk at a restaurant because of their eating disorder. Once we radically accept that it's hard to know what to say to my kid, their emotion is unpredictable. That allows us to stop the suffering, to stop kind of lying to ourselves that like, oh, if I said the perfect word, it'll be okay. Because that's a big part about what walking on eggshells is, is that we're trying so hard to be perfect so that someone else doesn't have an emotion or someone else doesn't have a reaction. But it is impossible for us to control other people's emotions and reactions, especially when they have an eating disorder. I want to read this other example to you. So this is another woman who's a family mentor at Equip. And she had a 13-year-old daughter who had anorexia. She said she was always walking on eggshells when it came to going out to restaurants. So we asked, how did you handle walking on eggshells? She said, I didn't handle it well initially. I've, I made the family get up and walk out of several restaurants. We were walking on eggshells. We were afraid of an outburst and it impacted our ability to enjoy the outing each and every time. It felt miserable for everyone. It was most hurtful since that is what, the fam that is what our family is all about. We are foodies. We were allowing the eating disorder to thrive in its secrecy and control our joy. So I asked her like, what tools were essential for her to move past the eggshells? She said for her, it was a decision that our family just couldn't live like this anymore. The eating disorder was an illness. It wasn't a way of life. I saw the impact on the rest of the family. What I did then was essentially cope ahead. It's a DBT skill we'll talk about in a second. Before heading out to the restaurant, I told my daughter where we were going and what her choices were. I gave her clear behavior limits. For example, she didn't have to talk, but she couldn't be disrespectful. She had to eat, she couldn't push back. Otherwise, we'd go home. That action caused her embarrassment, so it was a strong deterrent. What I also decided was that in the house, everything eating disorder related was fair to talk about, even if it meant that distress levels would rise. Radical authenticity and honesty had to be the prevailing mindset. She ends by saying, this is uncomfortable, and it's scary, and it can be overcome. The only way out is through, and the only way through the eggshells is to just let all the emotions in your house, 
And I think what sometimes happens is we open the door to the emotion, like we sweep up the eggshells a little bit one day and we're like, okay, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to say, you need to have another scoop of that. Did you eat your snack? We need to make sure you get scheduled with your therapist for this week. And they have a huge outburst. And then we go back to walking on eggshells. One of the keys to getting rid of the eggshells forever is to sweep them up, say whatever it is you need to say. If there's a huge outburst, do it again the next day. Do it again the next day. Do it again the next day. Outbursts only start to go away when they happen again and again and again. I like to talk a lot about um, what's called extinction bursts, and this is relevant to outbursts. So let's, again, go back to the basics. Let's go back to toddlers. I know this is not the same as an eating disorder, but sometimes understanding it is in its basics behavioral roots are what help people to get to the next step. So here in America, we go to Target a lot. There's lots of candy in the Target aisle and gum and all of the things that have been giving, especially the chewies. The dentist said, I think we had 10 cavities in my late, in one of my children in the latest visit and said, no more gummies, no more Starburst, no more Skittles, like no more of the candy that's going to just stick in between their teeth. So, uh, and these are little kids. <laughs> um, so the first time we go to the aisle in Target, and says, mom, can I have the Skittles? And I say, no, they're gonna take it up one level, whining. Why can't I have the Skittles? I wanna have the Skittles, it's not fair. I start to get embarrassed that they're whining. Are other people seeing this? Are they thinking that I'm a bad mom? So again, it's not just about their behavior, it's what we, what we say that it means about us. And so what I could do is say like, okay, fine, just like have the Skittles, stop whining. Now that, becomes that step one, the whining becomes the new baseline. So the next time that we're in Target, can I have the Skittles? Nope. Oh, mom isn't. And they start whining and I'm like, okay, I'm going to be strong. Nobody's really hearing it. Like it's fine. I'm going to say no again at this step one. Now this is the new baseline because they know, Hey, whining worked before. If whining doesn't, whatever worked before, they're going to try that plus one. So I say, I know you're whining, but like, nope, you're not getting it. So then the yelling starts. I want the Skittles. Oh my God, please take the Skittles. Just stop yelling. There's the new baseline. Step two now is our new baseline. So every time we go to Target and I have the Skittles, nope. Wine, nope. Now it's scream. If I say nope at the scream, then they're going to remember, they're always going to do the last thing that got it for them plus one. The eating disorder is the same way. So think of the times that the eating disorder has won. Whatever allowed the eating disorder to win, that's their baseline and plus one. So in Target, the plus one is laying on the floor and screaming. Plus one after that is throwing things and screaming. In order to make the extinction burst happen, you have to tolerate the plus one. So that's why if you sweep up eggshells one day, let all the emotions into your house, and then let the eggshells come back on the floor right away, now you've actually reset it. So the next time you sweep up the eggshells, the emotions are going to be that much higher and then that much higher. It's not until you're able to say no, and in this case, the Skittles, but also no to the eating disorder at this emotion and the plus one that the extinction burst will finally happen. So the extinction burst is whatever the worst is they've ever done, they do plus one worse than that. And if that still doesn't work, that's what brings it all back down. So that's what an extinction burst is in the literature. So this goes to cope ahead. So, okay, you know this, you know that like, okay, when I've asked before if they ate snack, they screamed at me, they stormed to their room, they swore at their brother, you know, it was awful. And I didn't like that behavior. So I have not asked about a snack again. So now it's time to cope ahead and think, okay, I wanna ask about the school snack because we gotta get on the school snack. Like we're working on gaining one to two pounds per week and we've been stagnant and I think the school snack is it. I think they're skipping their school snack. I need to be able to ask. I haven't asked in four days. I'm going to do it. Expect that whatever emotion came into the house the last time you did it, it'll be that plus one. And so that's kind of what cope ahead is about. So cope ahead might be saying to your child on a Saturday. Next week, when you're going to school, I'm going to be asking you every day after school how your snack went. It's okay if it annoys you. It's okay if you roll your eyes at me. And I need you to answer the question. And I need you to not um, 
whatever the behavior is that you need to not have happen. Now, you'll notice in the last essay I read, she said things like, you don't have to make conversation at the meal. You don't need to be funny at the meal. And I think that's a big thing for us too with walking on eggshells is deciding like, what are we going to tolerate and what are we not going to tolerate? So what we need is for our child to be eating dinner and eating in front of us so that we know that they got their meal. We don't need them to smile during it. We don't need them to compliment the meal. We don't need them to make conversation. I've, I've worked with families and seen things happen where, you know, the child who has an eating disorder is trying to eat dinner. And one of the siblings asks the child with an eating disorder a question like, hey, you know, what happened, uh, you know, at soccer today? And the child with an eating disorder doesn't answer. So the parents say, answer your sibling. They just asked you a question. That's asking way too much of them. The goal here is just for them to eat the meal. So this is what Cope Ahead about is deciding what are you going to tolerate and what are you not going to tolerate? So if for some people in the beginning, it's like all I need is for them to eat their meal. They can swear while they eat their meal. They can say mean things while they eat their meal. They just need to eat their meal. That's all I need. Then once you're having success with that, maybe you'll say they just need to eat their meal and I'd like them to not swear at their siblings while they eat their meal, something like that. But you'll figure out what your limits are going to be. And part of Cope Ahead is figuring out how you're going to react to it. So I am going to ask them if they ate their snack, or I am going to tell them to have another bite. And if they do this, I will do that. And if they do this, I will do that. And if I feel this way, I will tag out, or I will go into the bathroom and take 10 deep breaths. But figure it, just play the whole thing out in your head. And right now, for most of us, when we're playing the whole thing out in our head, we're like, yeah, let's just have the eggshell stay on the ground because we play it out in our head to the worst thing that can happen, which may happen, but we play it out in our head and then we don't imagine ourselves handling it well. The last part of Cope Ahead is imagining yourself getting through it and handling that outburst well and handling those emotions well. So that is part of Cope Ahead. I want to start opening this up a little bit to questions so we can have some actual scenarios to work it through. And I would love to do this one um, with physical violence and aggression. Um, I think that's a great question that you asked. And I know while not true for everyone, there's a lot of people whose kids are struggling with an eating disorder that causes them to act outside their values, including physical violence and aggression. So I'll read this aloud for everyone. How does physical violence and aggression fit in? I have strong and upsetting memories of being hit and kicked by my child. A year plus after completing treatment, we still have plenty of eggshells and accommodation to keep our household peaceful. And I still fear her escalating to violence. First of all, that makes a lot of sense. Like that's, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of parents who have PTSD after getting their child through an eating disorder. It is absolutely scary and soul crushing. And it makes sense that you fear that it's going to happen. And while you're trying to keep your household peaceful, it might not actually be that peaceful, right? Because you're living with all this anxiety, this fear that it might happen. And so this is when figuring out what are the things that you're doing to keep the household peaceful that are actually keeping the ed happy. And this is sitting down and having a conversation with your child, having a conversation with the other people in your household of like, we need to do these things. And I know the eating disorder doesn't wanna do this. It makes me afraid that physical violence or aggression might happen. Um, and we're gonna do this anyways. And this is how we're going to respond if there's physical violence. This is how we're going to respond if there's aggression. Lots of families have handled this different ways. There are some families in the US who have handled it with law enforcement. And there are other families in the US who are like, definitely not gonna bring law enforcement into it. It depends upon lots of factors and whether or not that's safe for them. Um, but that is one thing that I've seen some families do successfully is say, okay, I have to ask you this. I have to do this. And if you yell, that's fine. If you're angry, that's fine. I can tolerate you being angry. But if you hit me, I will be calling 911. Or if you hit me, I you will be receiving this consequence of having no access to your cell phone for a week. Or just figure out exactly what's going to come after it. Um, how do you change not walking on eggshells for the first year? How do you change your approach and let your daughter know that this is the new way? 
I think this is such a great opportunity to model for our children that we are human beings still figuring it out. They're not going to fully appreciate that we're human beings for probably another couple of decades, but nonetheless, you're starting to plant the seeds. And obvious, like, kind of like I, I, I say to my kids all the time when they like, they'll ask me sometimes in the middle of a presentation like this, Hey mom, can I go to my friend Will's house? And I'm like, read the room, not the time to ask, right? Like if you want a yes, there's the right time to ask. The same thing is true for a conversation like this with your kids. So if your child who's struggling with an eating disorder, don't have this conversation during a meal. This is the perfect thing to do like on a Saturday, downtime, away from any eating. And to say, listen, like we're gonna change a couple things around here. I need to be able to tell you when to eat more. I need to be able to ask about snack. I need to talk about the eating disorder and say the, eating, the word eating disorder. I know these things are going to be hard on you and they're gonna be really hard on your eating disorder, but I need to do them. I have been letting my anxiety control me. And instead I need to be, my anxiety is not gonna go away. I'm always gonna worry about you as your mother. But instead, I'm going to act from what I know I need to do in order to help kick the eating disorder out of the house. And I'm going to do this even though I'm anxious, even though I'm worried about you. So I know that it's a change and change is hard, but this is what we're going to start doing. They don't need to like it. They don't need to agree to it. They don't need to say, that's a great idea, mom, right? So have very, very low expectations and then just start doing it. Rip it off like a Band-Aid, but keep the eggshells out. So it's going to be very, very tempting the first day after sweeping up the eggshells. There's going to be a lot of emotion in your house and it's going to be exhausting. It's going to be tempting to let the eggshells come right back to be like, this was a bad idea. Let's just go back to being peace in the house. So this goes back to the self-care and the distress tolerance skills in DBT. Prepare yourself in advance. You can decide, you know what? Today's the, I actually don't know what today is. Today's the 10th. On the 15th, we're going to do no more eggshells. So for the next five days, I'm going to be calling my sister and my friends and let them know like, hey, the emotion in our house is about to go up. I'm about, uh, you know, and I also think the thing about it is like the emotion in your house is always there. We're just keeping it really quiet. We're just being super duper duper anxious. So you you already have tons of emotion in your house. We're just bringing in a different emotion in the house. We're bringing in louder emotions. We're bringing in more emotions. We're bringing, we're raising the volume. We're getting it out there. Instead of everyone keeping their emotions to themselves, we're going to let the emotions out. And letting your friends know, I'm about to go through some hard stuff, or letting your sister or your brother or your parents or whoever you can lean on. Start building up your self-care habits right now. It's kind of like you don't show up to run a marathon having not trained at all. You're going to sweep up the eggshells, have some stuff in place, like have a massage scheduled, have a walk with a friend scheduled, have a coffee date with a friend scheduled. Start scheduling some self-care activities. It's going to be really hard when you let the emotions into the house. It's only though by letting the emotions into the house that you're going to beat the eating disorder. No one has ever beat an eating disorder walking on eggshells because there are no magic words to say. Um, I'm loving these questions. How does this work with an adult child who lives in the house? It's hard to demand and insist that he eats a full meal of specific foods, et cetera. That is incredibly tough to do with adult children and figure out what leverage you have. Um, you can change how the, how your house runs and the rules that you have in your house. One of the things that's interesting about the 20 year olds, the 21 year olds is that they might be an adult by age, but they are dependent on us for a whole bunch of stuff. So figure out in a more a moment of calm with the other healthy adults that are in the household or that are in your life, what are the contingencies that you want to put in place that you can follow through on? So, right. There's the old adage of like, going on an eight hour road trip. And I have a lot of siblings and this happened a lot because we drove everywhere. Lots of like 20 hour road trips and dad yells, if you don't stop it, I'll turn the car around. But we're like, we've already driven eight hours. There's no way he's turning the car around, right? So don't make threats or consequences that you're not going to be able to follow through on because that's when the eating disorder is like, not a real threat. There's a loophole. I can find a way around there. So maybe for your 21 year old, it's car keys, maybe it's cell phone, maybe it's having the door on their bedroom um, and having privacy, maybe it's their laptop, maybe it's their iPad. I don't know what it is for your child. Um, think it through first though. Don't in a moment of frustration and anger um, throw out a consequence that you haven't used before. You have time, you have time. Spend a couple of days, 
talk to your your own therapist, your child's therapist, your friends, the other adults, people on the feast message board, they have really, really great ideas of how they've handled this with adult children and figure out, okay, this is what I want to try do. And this is what the consequences are. Explain it really calmly, but then cope ahead. Cope ahead means imagine all the things that can go wrong, but then also imagine yourself handling them well. Now, well, doesn't mean you don't cry. Well, doesn't mean you don't scream. Well, does it mean that you don't have moments in your head of like, what am I doing? Am I doing this all wrong? So just really, really like wash yourself of this idea that there is a perfect thing to say or a perfect way to do it. You're just going to keep trying. And as long as you're walking on eggshells, you're not trying new things. Um, what fear comes from the threat of suicidal ideation? I'll keep reading this, but just want to pause for a second. There is, there is nothing more soul crushing than hearing your child say that they don't want to live, especially as the ones who gave our child life, right? And so I just want to just hold a moment for all of you parents who have experienced that and how incredibly hard it is. So please lean on other people for support. Um, in addition to the threats or voicing it, the thoughts that come across her notes that she's written over the year, how do I overcome eggshells of this fear? You don't. You don't, you will always be afraid of your child taking their life. You'll always be afraid of your child dying, even if they aren't suicidal, right? It's, it's the reason why even parents of very healthy, normal teenagers are worried at night when they know their child is out driving around. Are they driving well? Are the other people on the roads, uh, are the other people on the road driving well? Are they drinking? You're never going to stop worrying about your child. And this is really, really, really hard make a plan, make a plan in a moment of calm. It doesn't need to be with your child, but with other healthy adults of exactly what the plan is. So when you tell me, when I ask you to take another bite and you tell me I'm going to kill myself, which is something that I know has happened across a lot of dinner tables, say, I understand that this is how that makes you feel. Since you're feeling that way, we're going to have you sleep on the floor of um, our bedroom tonight in a sleeping bag. Uh, there are a lot of skills that DBT therapists in particular have around how to address suicidal ideation in a way that prioritizes, first and foremost, making sure that your child is safe. And then second, making sure that we're not accidentally reinforcing suicidal ideation. So what do I mean by that in an example? It's not uncommon. Our child says that they want to harm themselves to say, you have to sleep with me tonight. And what does that mean? It means I'm kicking my spouse out and my child gets to sleep in a nice warm coffee bed with their mommy. And it kind of is nice for me. It's kind of nice for them. It's a little bit reinforcing, right? Instead, that's why we say things like, listen, I understand that you feel that way. And I'm so sorry you feel that way. Feeling suicidal is, is scary. I'm going to have you sleep. Uh, that means you need to be with me for the next 24 hours. I need to see you at all times. And so I bring your sleeping bag into our room. Um, you're going to be sleeping on the floor of our room. Okay, let's finish up this meal. Now, that's hard to say. That's hard to do. This is when you have to practice. You have to cope ahead. But I think one thing to remember for the person who wrote this in is you're walking on eggshells and trying to not say the wrong thing so that they don't hurt themselves. But saying perfect things or being on eggshells does in no way guarantee that they're not going to hurt themselves. In many ways, hearing the threats, reading the notes, hearing that they want to hurt themselves is what you need in order to keep them safe. So if you walk on eggshells so that they never say, I hate you, I'm going to kill myself, I can't believe you keep making me do this, well, then you don't know that they're struggling. And so we need them to be voicing when they feel like hurting themselves in order for us to make sure that the house is safe and help keep them safe. So, and this is a really harsh thing to say to someone that I, I can't see. And I know that all of us are really trying our best, but I love that you wrote, how do I overcome eggshells of this fear? And you're right, it's your fear. So you're walking on eggshells to help you not be as afraid but we actually need to hear when our child wants to hurt themselves. And so it's better to sweep up the eggshells and hear the suicidal ideation and hear the suicidal threats so that we can help keep them safe or bring in people that can help make them safe. Um, someone wrote in, we took away the car keys and it hasn't made an impact. Completely tracks. I think that's one of the things that's both wonderful and so incredibly frustrating with helping especially teenagers and adults get over an eating disorder is 
for everything that works for one child, doesn't work for my child. No two children are the same. Keep trying things. One of my favorite stories to tell, um, this happened when I was running group therapy and there was a parent whose child needed to be having about an extra thousand calories a day. So they were doing the shake and uh, this dad, he'd come into group every week and be like, oh, like this shake just languishes all day long. I fight with her about it in the, like, so he would make it for her in the morning. I'd fight with her about it in the morning. And then like, I'd get home from work and she'd get home from school. And like that shake is still there. And I'd fight with her about it. And then we finished dinner and that shake is still on the coffee table. It's taking little sips at a time. And he's like, and making ring, like the condensation rings on the coffee table. He's like, I'm so sick of this shake. I fight with her about it like 12 hours a day. And parents are giving suggestions like, okay, have you tried the cell phone threat? And have you tried the this? And like, so he's like trying to figure out like, what's the consequence that's going to work? Just like couldn't figure it out. We kept saying like, okay, you know your child best, figure out what consequence is salient for them. You know your child best, figure out what consequence is salient for them. Like four or five weeks of this go by, he comes into group one day and he's like, I figured it out. He was so excited. But he said, what he started doing was he would make the shake in the morning and not hand it to her. He'd put it in the cup holder of his car. And then he'd be like, okay, it's time for me to drive you to school. And you can drink this shake on your way to school. Um, and don't worry, I've pushed back my morning meeting. And I told your school that you might be late to first period. Um, but we'll just sit in the car together until you finish the shake. And then you can go to first period. Well, for his child, the fear of walking into first period late the consequence of all of her peers turning around and looking at her as she walked in late, way too much for her to handle. She finished that shake in eight minutes every single day um, and it worked. So this is all to say that like, yeah, taking the cell phone away didn't have an impact on her. The car keys didn't have an impact on her. The, you can't hang out with your friends on the weekends didn't have an impact on her. Removing her from the soccer team didn't have an impact on her. What he found was that the consequence of being late to first period was what did it for her. And so for all of you, it can be incredibly disheartening saying, great advice didn't work. Great advice didn't work. Keep on trying. Find the thing that is salient for your child. How do you figure out what pushback from your child is coming from a place of an eating disorder or a place of typical teenager development? We're past the phase of restoring weight. She wants more autonomy, understandably. And I still feel that it's necessary to maintain oversight. I'm not sure if I'm still accommodating the eating disorder. To the person who asked that, I think there's so many parents probably nodding their head as I read that aloud. I think that's so true. And, and it's hard because the eating disorder fights you and there's normal teenage wanting to fight you. I think this is a great place of using data. So giving a little bit of freedom and seeing what happens. Um, I implied from here, we are past the phase of restoring weight. So your child is someone who has restored weight before. It makes sense that you want to have oversight of some meals still to make sure that, I mean, we know how quickly kids who had to restore weight can lose that weight. Um, and try a few experiments out. Okay, I've been having oversight of X, Y, and Z. You know what? I'm not going to have oversight of Z for the next seven days. And we're going to be, you know, doing a weigh-in at the pediatrician before it starts and a pediatrician after those seven days, or you do it at home or however you choose to do it. And if the weight stays exactly the same, then I'm going to let go of control of Z 50% of the time. So just start titrating, titrate kind of like you would with a teenager who hadn't been through an eating disorder. Don't give up all control all at once. Just give up a little bit at a time. And I think we're walking on eggshells comes in here is wanting to kind of like not bring it up. So having these conversations again and again and again, it'll start reducing the power of the eating disorder. It'll start reducing the emotions that come around it. Sometimes it's helpful to think of other times you've been really successful with this when it has nothing to do with an eating disorder. So maybe think about, you know, a relationship with a spouse or relationship with a sibling or with a friend and you had to have a hard conversation. And the first time you had that hard conversation, it was hard. But then if you talked about that same topic again, the second time, it was a bit easier. And the third time, it was a bit easier. And a fourth time, it was a bit easier. So know that if you sweep up the eggshells, it will be hard. And then it gets a little bit easier and a little bit easier because you get practice talking about it. Kind of like the Voldemort example that Una gave, you start taking away the power. It starts getting less and less scary. And in many ways, it's, it's exposure therapy for us parents talking about like, I want to talk with you about how you want to hurt yourself. Um, and because of that, I am going to be doing sweeps of your room 
to make sure that there aren't sharp objects and we're going to be locking up the meds and you're going to be sleeping in my uh, sleeping in the sleeping bag on the floor of my room um, or taking the door off or whatever it is you choose to do. The first time you have a conversation with your child about their suicidality, you're going to feel like you can't breathe. You're going to be holding back tears. Your heart is going to be in your throat. And then the second time, it's a little bit easier. And the third time, it's a bit easier. It's exposure therapy. The emotions just won't be intense as you do it again and again. And you're modeling for your kids. We can do hard things. We can have hard conversations. I am here for you when you are angry and I'm here for you when you're happy. Um, so it, it truly is an only way out is through. Um, I'm walking on eggshells about my 16 year old child with anorexia who smokes pot a few times a week. I've punished for pot in the past, but now I've put it on the back burner. I feel like I can only battle the eating disorder. She's almost weight restored and it's eggshells right now. Should we be addressing the pot more openly and firmly? Just like you're speaking about making talk of the eating disorder more open. I think this is a great thing for you to talk about with your child's providers and the other adults in the household is whether or not you want to ta tackle pot. Um, Another story that I really like, uh, there is this mother that I was working with and she was annoyed with her daughter for a lot of reasons and made sense. I think any parent would be. And I asked her, I'm like, hey, what do you want? Like if I had a magic wand and your daughter was doing things differently, what would it be? She's like, okay, I want her to stop vomiting. I want her to stop cutting. I want her to stop swearing in front of her brother. I want her to do her homework without being asked. I want her to stop smoking pot. I want her to stop dyeing her hair. I want her to be on time for church. And she had this list of like 14 things. First of all, absolutely loved this mother's honesty. And I said, I'm like, okay, what if you can only have two? And she's like, well, I know I'm supposed to say the vomiting and the self-harm, but like, I'm really sick of fighting with her about her homework. And I really don't like when she swears in front of her brother. And again, absolutely loved her honesty. And so I think for you asking this question about this, about pot, that's kind of where you're at with all of this. Of like, okay. If you can only fight two, what are the ones you're going to fight? And I think it's also like, how is it impacting their life? I don't know how or if your daughter's pot smoking is affecting their life. Now, I'm not saying every 16 year old should smoke, but I'm saying a 16 year old who needed to weight restore from an eating disorder, that was the priority. And it sounds like you and your family did a great job of making that the priority. And then figure out, is her pot smoking making her eating disorder worse? Is it making her more depressed? Is she someone who struggles with depression? Is it getting in the way of her having friendships? Or is it increasing her appetite and helping her eating disorder? Or is it helping her to sleep instead of being up all night with anxiety? So I think kind of talking with the other adults, um, talking with her medical providers and figuring out if you only get to work with two, what are the two that you're going to tackle? Um, but I would not walk on eggshells with the pot if it bothers you, right? So let's say you decide we're not going to, we're not going to address the pot. My 16 year old is going to be in some ways a typical 16 year old and smoke pot every once in a while. And it's going to bother me and that's okay. And so you can say to her, like, I don't like that you smoke pot. I don't condone that you smoke pot. You're not allowed to smoke pot in our house. I'd like you to do a better job of trying to hide that you're smoking pot. Like a normal teenager would try to keep it from their parents. Um, and the two things that I'm most focused on is that you continue to increase the variety of food you eat and the frequency that you eat and that your weight doesn't slip and that you continue to go to therapy regularly and that you aren't self-harming or whatever. Like you decide like these are the must, but be open with her about how you're feeling with it. Um, but it is, I think that's one of the hardest things about eating disorder coming in is that you're like, well, if there was no eating disorder, then they definitely would be doing their homework on time and there'd be no pot in the house. Um, but this is kind of a, a picking and choosing your battles moment. But that doesn't mean you need to have eggshells. So you can both be like, fine, I'm going to ignore the pot smoking, but you don't need to walk on eggshells about it. Um, Judy, there's so many great questions. I'm not sure if any stood out to you that you want to make sure that I get to. Um, there is one actually that does. Um, yeah. Some of walking on eggshells comes from my concerns about the trauma my younger daughter experiences with my eating disorder daughter's behavior. I'm often alone with both girls and would love suggestions on how DBT can be used to support siblings or if there are best practices when challenging the eating disorder while siblings are present. And I love that question because, you know, it's one thing not to walk on eggshells, but it's another thing of how to balance that when you're with the rest of your family and, you know, the confrontation, if it's that extreme, it is obviously going to impact everyone. I absolutely love that question. Yes. Um, I think first let's go with the, what seems like 
the, the safe example. Let's just walk on eggshells so that little sister isn't traumatized every single night at dinner and every single morning at breakfast before going to school. And I think all of us, if we talk to some of our adult friends, we all know people who are like, oh, my parents hated each other, but we all just walked on eggshells and pretended to be happy at breakfast and pretended to be happy at dinner. And we see like how that kind of affects them as adults. Maybe they're the people pleasers. Maybe they're the ones that are never asking for what they want and trying to like keep everything nice for everybody else. So I think it's important to remember that it's not like letting the eating disorder take over the house at breakfast, lunch, and dinner is bad for the healthy sibling. Also, letting the walking on eggshells and pretending to be happy and like everything's fine is also not good for the healthy sibling. And so this is when it's great to start having the one-on-one -on -one conversations with the healthy sibling that are really transparent about what's happening. Your older brother, your older sister, your older sibling um, has an eating disorder. And what that means is that their brain is not working in the same way that your brain is when it comes to things around food and their body and emotions. And I wish it wasn't like this and it's hard, but it causes them to act outside their values. So I'm going to make rules in the house that like if they are, you know, if they are screaming at you at breakfast, I'm going to walk them upstairs calmly and have them drink a boost in their room instead of eating breakfast with you so you can have it, you know, so you can have breakfast downstairs. Um, but just, I'd say, call it out and be real. Like kids are so stinking smart. They know everything that's going on. They know if you're walking on eggshells and they know if their sibling is screaming at you or them or saying awful things. And I would just start having conversations with it, but I would just challenge the idea that walking on eggshells is what's keeping that younger child safe. That younger child knows exactly what's kind of happening. Um, I think that another aspect of it when it comes to DBT skills is being really transparent with your child about how like, wow, when, let's just call him John, when John is yelling at dinner, it makes my heart start racing. It makes me start worrying what's going to happen next. And I feel just also really sad. How do you feel when John starts yelling at dinner? And then maybe their stomach hurts. Maybe they start sweating. Maybe they're just like, I just really want it to stop. Um, and so letting them know that you have emotions, that you feel them in your body, you have thoughts in your head. So what I'm going to start doing after dinner is going on a walk with our neighbor. Do you want to come on the walk with us after dinner to clear our mind after the hard things that we're going through? This is sometimes where I also really like the cancer metaphor, right? So let's say the same thing. Their sibling's going through chemo treatment. And the chemotherapy is hard and it makes their sibling cry and it makes their sibling be in pain. They don't like seeing that either, right? And so then we talk about how hard it is seeing someone who's in pain and seeing someone who's struggling. And we talk about it um, and we acknowledge that we're just gonna have a lot of different feelings about it and some of the feelings are hard and that we're gonna move through it. Um, but I just wanna challenge the idea that walking on eggshells is actually keeping the younger sibling safe. Um, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, you are a superwoman because you moderated your own questions, which really never happens. So it allowed me to relax. So I really appreciate that. Um, but thank you. This was an absolutely incredible webinar. Um, for those of you who asked, um, it is being recorded and it will be put on the Feast website within the next few days. Um, so if there's someone in your household that you'd like to see it, if you'd like to review it again, um, then you're welcome to take a look at, the, you know, at your leisure when it's on the website. Um, and uh, we'd just like to end by asking for people's help. Um, Feast relies on the generosity of our community to run programs like this. So please donate if you can, and you can just go to our website and click the donate button. And our next webinar is going to be on September 21st. Um, it's actually a really interesting topic, a little bit different um, than the things that we usually discuss, but it's tips for researching and understanding data on eating disorders. Um, so if you happen to be a professional who is at this webinar, please tell your friends, because I think it's actually something that's really applicable to the professional community, as well as to the parent community. So I would like to thank everyone so much for being with us today. Um, please join us next month. Erin, thank you so much, and goodbye, everyone. Thank you for having me. And so impressed with all of you parents. You're doing really, really hard, great work. Thanks for having me. Bye.